Hello and welcome everybody. This is European VAX update and global trends. My name is Caitlin and I am so excited to be your MC for today. And I'm really excited about today because we are gonna be covering a few things, specifically value added tax, VAT. If you have heard this acronym being thrown around, we are going to dive in a little bit deeper into what exactly that is and what that can mean for your business. In addition to that, we're also going to be covering recent and future changes in Europe. And then we'll wrap it all up with some steps to ensure continuous client compliance throughout the entire journey. Before we dive in, just a few housekeeping items. I have my disclaimer slide here. A warm reminder that Avalara cannot provide legal tax advice, but we want to answer your questions as best as we can. So if you have a question, go ahead and use the ask a question box. Up next is our safe harbor statement. I'm gonna leave this slide up to give you a chance to review it while I cover, cover other house, housekeeping items. First, we are recording today's event. So if you wanna watch it again, share with a colleague, you will get the recording in about 24 hours. The console that you're looking at can be customized, so feel free to move or resize any of those windows. The additional resources section today is chock full of really great related resources, including today's slide deck. If there are any you would like to check out, I highly recommend clicking on them now. But we'll open up in a new tab and be waiting for you um, at the end of the webinar. The console will automatically close at the end. So if you click on them now, you'll be able to access them at a later time. Again, if you have any questions, use that ask a question box. We are going to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Group chat. So if you've been to one of our webinars before, you know that there is one um, chat feature that's hiding. So down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a bar of icons. And then you'll see one with two chat bubbles. If you click that, that will open up our chat feature. This allows you to ask questions to other Avalara customers in this virtual room and connect with other peers and um, those in your industry. I always like to warm it up and say, hello, this is my first name and this is where I'm tuning in from. So hello from Seattle, Washington. If you have any technical issues with your console, with this platform, there's a question mark icon down at the bottom of the screen. We are offering one CPE credit for today's presentation. For those looking to receive CPE credit today, please know that we will ask you to respond to three of the four poll questions. You must also attend 50 minutes of the presentation. We highly recommend not splitting or tiling your screen on your computer as this can affect the poll question. The poll questions are going to pop up on your screen. They're not gonna show up in the slides. No, they're gonna pop up on your screen. And we're actually gonna do one right now. So you should be seeing a poll question on your screen, on your console right now. It should pop up right in the center this is just a little bit of a warm up question. We'll have three more. What brings you to our webinar today? What are you looking to learn? Um, are you experiencing changes in your business? Do you just want the CPE credit? That's totally fine too. But tell us what brings you um, to this webinar today? Are you planning to sell internationally or sell internationally now? Let us know. All right, it is time to present the true rock star of today, and that is Michelle. Michelle is an international customer programs manager at Avalara. 
She might be a familiar face for a few of you. She actually joined Avalara eight, nine years ago in 2014 and has worked with our European customers, American business, American businesses and customers. So you may have worked with Michelle in the past. Michelle is our resident and go-to expert for everything that. She is a wealth of knowledge. And so I just can't think of a better person really to be leading this conversation. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and leave you on the agenda slide and let you take it from here. All right, thanks for the introduction, Caitlin. I'm happy to be here. All right, so here's the plan for the day. Um, we'll, we are in the middle of the welcome and agenda so, uh, part of this session. We're gonna do a quick review of VAT 101, just in case this is a, a new concept for anyone. Um, then we'll talk about um, some recent trends um, that have happened, or some recent changes in the European Union and the UK, uh, and then just talk about global trends. Give me one second to get organized here. For some reason my camera doesn't want to cooperate. Sorry, everybody. We'll see if this uh, does the trick if I jiggle the handle here. Um, and then we'll introduce the concept of continuous compliance. So this is how um, the steps that you'll need to take anywhere in the world to make sure that you are compliant. While my camera starts thinking about what it's doing, I'm going to carry on. All right, so let's start with another poll qu question. Um, how would you rank your knowledge of VAT? Is this absolutely a new concept? Um, are you a intermediate um yeah <laughs> intermediate or are you an absolute vat expert if you're a vat expert you might be in the wrong training uh, <laughs> unless you came for uh e-invoicing and e-commerce reforms but uh ho hopefully you'll still get some great information today i have a camera now this is excellent Okay, now we can get going. All right, so let's start with VAT 101. Uh, we're going to start with some terminology uh, in case this is a, a new concept and also because um, partially because of the topic we're discussing, but also because of my background, some of the terms that you're going to that we're going to hear today um, will be interchangeable. You'll hear some things in British English and some in American English. The first thing um, that we, we need to stop saying is VAT tax. Uh, VAT is value added tax. So if you're saying VAT tax, that's value added tax tax. Uh, some other things you'll hear are turnover. This is just your annual revenue. Uh, nil, this means zero. Uh, taxable person is a VAT registered organization. So this is somebody that has a VAT ID. Uh, reporting is what we would probably call returns in the US. I think stock and inventory is, uh, is pretty clear. That's stuff that you own. Um, and then digital services versus digital goods. This is any product that is delivered electronically. Okay, so again, definition of value added of VAT, it is value added tax. Um, and this is a consumption tax that is levied on supplies of taxable goods and services. It's the most common indirect tax in the world. Over 150 countries are, are using this. Uh, it's an ad valorem tax, so it's applied as a percentage of the supply. And it's ultimately suffered by the final consumer in a chain of transactions. So, so far, it sounds just like sales tax. Uh, let's talk about how it's a little bit different. The primary difference between VAT and sales tax is that VAT is applied at every stage of a supply chain. So at each point when, so when something gets sold from uh, one seller to the next buyer, the supplier charges output VAT if it applies to that particular transaction. But in a lot of cases, the buyer can recover that as input VAT that they paid to the previous supplier. Now, the, here's where it gets a little bit complicated for Americans that are used to using exemption certificates. Uh, you don't always have to charge VAT if you're talking if you're selling to businesses. 
This can be simplified via the uh, reverse charge mechanism. Uh, with the reverse charge, this shifts the responsibility for VAT to the buyer. So there are some similarities to sales tax, but um, VAT is not just easy sales tax. Uh, here are some of the things that will need to be taken into consideration, uh, especially if you're doing business in the European Union. So that's your business in the center of the screen. Um, those are your customers on the top left. Your vendors are on the bottom left and the tax authorities over on the right. Now, the part that's um, not too challenging for a lot of businesses is the sales piece to your customers. Uh, in most countries, they're going to have fewer rates. Um, the complications there are understanding the correct place of supply, um, how to handle businesses versus consumers, um, and then reporting those transactions. Purchases can be a little more challenging because if uh, your vendors are charging you VAT, you have to decide whether you have to actually pay that or if that's recoverable. Some of the real challenges come with the reporting piece, so getting your returns filed. Uh, we'll talk a lot more about that in our next session on, uh, on managing VAT compliance, uh, but the returns can be pretty challenging. Okay, um, today we're mostly gonna be focus focusing on European VAT. So some of the challenges that are unique to the European Union, there are first of all, 27 member states. Uh, in case you missed the news, the UK left the EU last year. Uh, there are 21 different languages in the European Union. So understanding local law in a different language and getting those returns in can be a, a challenge. There are also 10 different currencies. So most countries do have uh, the euro, and that's usually supported on returns, but some will require local currency. So the EU does have a harmonized system of VAT, but it's not completely uniform. So a lot of things are the same. There, there are certain, uh, certain things that every country has to abide by, but they can have their own individual flavors. Uh, place of supply rules can be challenging. So uh, place of supply is what we would call sourcing in sales tax. This is which tax authority gets the taxes. So this can vary based on who you're selling to uh, where and where you're based and also what it is that you're selling them. Goods and services are treated differently. Uh, and then the reverse charge. Uh, figuring out whether you are able to apply the reverse charge or not can be um, can be different uh, depending on your status, your customer status, and again, what you're selling. Okay, so let's talk about some of the challenges in international indirect tax. Now, some of these are gonna be the same for domestic and international tax. So no matter where in the world you're trading, you have to understand what your registration requirements are um, we're all having logistics complications these days, technical challenges, getting your tax engine set up and uh, making sure that your customers can get to your e-commerce site and buy something. Uh, calculating tax correctly can be a challenge and then reporting and remitting taxes. This is further complicated when you're doing business internationally because on top of all the other things, you have to deal with exchange rates, language barriers, uh, your customers may have very different expectations than your US customers do, uh, different time zones, both with your customers, tax authorities, and whoever, whoever is doing your returns. And then in addition to calculating tax, you also have to think about customs and duties. So here's what we hear from companies that are trading internationally. Uh, their biggest pain points these days are uh, shipping delays, um, supply chain costs and delays, calculating tax correctly. Um, in some cases, communication with customers and vendors and uh, poor user experience for cross-border shoppers. And we're seeing a, and this is actually old data. What we're seeing in the last two years is customers are not only buying more, they're returning more. So uh, that's costing customers money to get their goods back to them. Um, the good news is that these are all solvable problems uh, with, the white, with the right automation solution. Um, 
can't do much about uh, supply chain and shipping delays, but the rest we can certainly help with. So the other challenge is that customers are having to do a lot more with either the same resources or less. Um, most customers are saying that their tax budget is going to be flat or be reduced, uh, just as shifting uh, customer demand and regulations is having a major impact on their business. Uh, most customers do not expect to increase their headcount to manage these challenges. All right, so let's move on to the next poll question. Uh, are you currently selling into Europe? Um, yes, no, but you're planning to, or not on the immediate roadmap, but maybe someday. Okay, moving forward, uh, let's talk about some recent changes in Europe, um, some things that you can expect to see in the next year or two, and then we'll talk about global trends. All right, so let's first of all talk about uh, changes in your business. So a lot of our customers are seeing uh, rapid growth uh, especially in international trade, customers are buying a lot more from, uh, from foreign businesses. Mergers and acquisitions. If you're acquiring companies that are either based in other locations or they're selling to the rest of the world, um, they may have different levels of um, compliance and technology adoption. Uh, globalization, that's why we're all here. We're seeing a lot of our customers um, selling on marketplaces or even becoming marketplaces themselves. And this can have a major impact on your back compliance. Uh, we're also seeing customers sell via different channels. So maybe you went direct to consumer before, and now you are selling to resellers. Uh, and also changes in products. Um, this is something that can impact your back compliance. So uh, maybe you sold one or two things for years, and now you added something else and are discovering that it's taxed differently in some places. Uh, and processes. So we're, we're seeing um, uh, internal technology process as well as compliance processes change. Now the piece that is causing a lot of our customers headaches is uh, changes from tax authorities. We are seeing an unprecedented level of change in that compliance. Um, used to be that you could set up a rate table and you were good for a couple years. Um, that's getting harder to do these days. We're also seeing tax authorities be a lot more aggressive about collecting taxes um, and a lot more scrutiny on international transactions. Um, in modernization, we're seeing tax authorities move to digital reporting um, and um, electronic submission of returns. So in 2020, 2021 alone, uh, there were several major changes in the UK and the EU, probably more changes in the last two years than in the last 20 years combined. Uh, so the first thing that happened right on January 1st, 2021, Brexit. The UK left the EU, uh, which meant that they also left the EU customs regime and the VAT regime. So this was a major headache for, um, for European and British businesses and consumers. UK also expanded their uh, making tax digital requirement, um, and they continue to expand that. So you're no longer able to report your UK returns manually. You need software to do that. In July of 2021, the EU introduced new e-commerce and marketplace rules. Uh, this is probably the one that's had the biggest impact on your business. We'll, we'll talk a lot more about that uh, in a moment. Um, to make that a little bit easier, they introduce the import one-stop shop. So at least you can, if you are subject to those changes, you can get a single return and registration for that. Uh, and e-invoicing. We're seeing it. We saw several countries um, introduce or expand e-invoicing and digital reporting requirements. All right. So hopefully Brexit is old news for all of this. 
Um, but I do want to talk a bit about what the impact of Brexit was, uh, both for, um, for, for companies selling into the UK and for consumers. Uh, now, keep in mind that a lot of British and European customers were buying a lot of local goods. Um, so for them, this was the first time they ever had to worry about uh, import VAT customs and duties. It was a major shock to customers that they had to pay more to buy things from Europe. Um, in fact, we saw, um, well, we saw a lot more of blocked and returned items because customers couldn't get their stuff. Um, now, the purpose of these e-commerce reforms was to um, stop international sellers from not adding VAT to low value goods. And it worked. In the first 10 days after the UK left the EU, we saw the average cost of goods on Amazon uh, from marketplace sellers increase by about 18%. The UK VAT rate is 20%. So uh, that tells you that a, a lot of merchants just weren't charging tax. So caused a major headache. Hopefully we're, we've got Brexit in order now if, if you do have uh, British or European entities. Let's talk about exactly what those reforms were. Uh, so again, this came into effect on the 1st of January. It applies to all business to consumer imports. So anything shipped from outside the UK to a UK consumer, and it applies to low value consignments. So consignment is one box of stuff sold from one vendor to one buyer in one day. So any consignment valued at 135 pounds or less has to have VAT calculated at checkout, and it has to be reported on a UK VAT return. So what this means is that if you ever sell something to a UK consumer with a value of less than 135 pounds, you need to have a UK VAT registration and a URI number, and those need to be um, added to your, uh, to your uh, declarations forms. Uh, another thing that came into play at the same time was marketplace facil facilitator rules. So uh, marketplaces have to report those low value consignments. Um, anything above that, um, they have to give customers information so that they can file their own UK returns for the higher value goods. We've got lots of information on this if you're curious. Uh, we've got several Brexit guides for US sellers. So the UK's changes were actually based on, um, on the EU e-commerce reforms. Remember that up until this point, the UK was part of the EU. The EU has been planning this for years. Um, they finally enacted this on the 1st of July, 2021, and it's very similar to the UK requirements. Uh, their low value consignment threshold is 150 euro. So if you're, un if you're at 150 euro or less, any goods sold to consumers have to have that calculated at the customer's location at the point of checkout. Uh, it has to be reported on either a local VAT return and IOS or an IOS return. Um, if you really don't want to get registered, you can have what they call a special arrangement with a postal service. Uh, so this is absolutely a, a legal way to do it. Uh, it is very expensive. We're seeing shipping providers charge as much as $15 per shipment. So what this means for your business is that if you sell anything to a consumer under 150 euro, you need to have either your own VAT registration uh, or you need to be working with a postal carrier to, to ship on their VAT registration. Just like the UK, there are also marketplace rules. So marketplaces have to uh, collect and report VAT on low value consignments, and they have to provide merchants with, uh, with reports for, for the rest. So to make this somewhat simplified, um, the EU has extended the mini one-stop shop to um, the one-stop shop and import one-stop shop. So you can now get a single registration and file a single return in all 27 EU countries. Uh, the challenge here is that higher value consignments can't be reported on your IOS return. So if you sell both low value goods and higher value goods, uh, you've got some options. You can either just not collect import VAT on the higher value consignments um, and hold your customers responsible for that. You can work with a shipping provider and have them collect the import VAT 
Um, or if you are very high revenue in certain places, you can get direct registrations in those countries uh, and, and report those on a standard VAT return. So in general, um, we are seeing absolutely unprecedented change across the globe. So more rigorous enforcement of existing rules um, and rapid changes, uh, lots of new rules coming down the road. Uh, and buyers expectations are changing. Um, they're not only buying more internationally, they're expecting um, faster delivery and for tax to be calculated correctly so that if they're buying goods, the orders aren't delayed. If they're businesses, uh, they wanna make sure that their VAT invoices are correct. So um, some specific things that we're seeing are additional scrutiny of business to business transactions, um, e-invoicing and digital reporting mandates. In some countries we're seeing uh, VAT withholding. So this is where instead of having a foreign seller get registered, if a local business buys something internationally, they just take that money out um, via the bank transfer before they even get the money uh, or before they even send you the money. Uh, withdrawal of business to business registration exemptions. So there are certain countries where um, before you didn't need to register if you were totally B2B, now you do. Um, changes we're seeing from customers are, um, first of all, an increase in buying, um, but customers are expecting very rapid delivery and they expect you to be shipping DDP. They don't want any surprise import costs. Uh, Business customers expect compliant VAT invoices. Keep in mind that your business buyers are probably subject to e-invoicing and digital reporting mandates. They wanna make sure you're sending them good data. Um, so we're actually seeing businesses start to request e-invoices or request that their vendors act as the importer of record. They wanna shift some of that responsibility to their vendors. Ah, there we go. Changes driven by governments. Uh, we're seeing reduced distance selling thresholds. So used to be that you could sell a certain amount in country in a country and not have to register. We're seeing those distance distance selling thresholds come down um, or be eliminated if you're selling low value uh, low value goods. Uh, again, tax authorities are paying extra attention to B two B transactions and international transactions. Okay, the next trend we are seeing is uh, something that Avalara is calling the death of the VAT return. And this is a shift, and we're seeing this across the world, to digital reporting and e-invoicing. So we're seeing a move from a self-assessed summary periodic return. So this is where every month or every quarter, you look at all of your data, you do some math, you fill out some boxes on a form, you tell the tax authority how much tax you owe them. Um, to periodic returns that have additional data on them, returns that have to be submitted electronically, uh, all the way to transaction level data um, and for governments um, expecting real time data. So if we start over on the left, um, the first two things here are new requirements that you don't necessarily need software to do. Um, you could still do all of this manually. So these are things like SAFT, uh, which is just a, a, it's a standardized report with some additional information that you wouldn't really expect to see on a VAT return. As we move over to the right, um, we get into things like UK making tax digital. Now this is their same VAT return that they've had for ages. Uh, it's actually a very simple one. There's only nine boxes on it, but you can no longer submit your UK return without HMRC approved software. Um, the software has to have a direct connection from your source system to the HMRC portal. Um, they, started, they sort of did a soft landing with this one. Only certain businesses had to do it. For a while, you were able to use bridging software so you didn't have to pull directly from your source system. Uh, that's all gone away as of November 1st, 2022. Uh, so now if you are selling into the UK, you need to have UK MTD compliance software. 
From there, it gets a little trickier. So uh, we see things like Spanish SII. So this is where you have to send transaction level information um, at least every four days. They do at least give you a little bit of a buffer. Then we see things like India GST, where you send the, the tax authority all of your transaction data, and they generate a draft VAT return, or GST or VAT return for you. Uh, then we move into real-time reporting. So this is like the Spanish requirement where you send transaction level data, but it's either same day or real time. From there, we move on, move into true e-invoicing requirements. Uh, Brazil was the first to do this. They've had it for ages. Uh, this is where you are sending data to the tax authority and they're reviewing that and either generating an invoice for you or giving you approval to generate an invoice. And depending on the country, um, they're either giving you that approval to send an invoice to your customer or they're sending the invoice to your customer. There's a lot of different flavors of this. Uh, we can go into uh, e-invoicing another time, uh, but the point here is that we're seeing a lot of these and you need a software solution to, to do any of these. So what further complicates these is Digital reporting and e-invoicing mandates vary from country to country, and they evolve over time. So we're seeing things like it, in Italy, they introduced e-invoicing, I think about three years ago, and it's already changed twice since then. So uh, you might be able to implement uh, one year and then have to update it a couple years later. More likely what's happening is they're ha they'll have the same technology requirement but they're requiring more businesses to comply with that. Uh, so some things that should be on your radar for 2023, um, the new requirements in Portugal, um, Saudi Arabia is finally going live with their requirements. Uh, 2024, I think uh, most of our customers are, are most concerned about France. Uh, so again, we're seeing a lot more of these across the globe. Um, <clears throat> we do expect to see a lot more of them. And the reason that we're seeing this is um, tax authorities are trying to reduce their VAT gap. The, and the VAT gap is um, the VAT that should be collected and isn't or, um, or underreported VAT. Uh, E-invoicing makes it easier for tax authorities to get your data. And if you're having this in data in real time, it's a lot harder to commit VAT fraud. There, there's no time to uh, massage your data before you submit the returns. Uh, the other reason we're seeing it happening is it's working. Uh, when Italy first introduced SDI, they expected to collect a, a certain, certain amount more VAT that, uh, the next year, and they actually doubled the amount of VAT collected. So. Uh, Countries across the globe are seeing the impact that this can have, and they are introducing their own e-invoicing mandates. So what this means for your business um, is that you really need to start implementing a global tax compliance strategy. Um, historically, even if you were trading in multiple countries, it was periodic filing, not that hard. Uh, most companies had a local tactical approach, right? So you start trading in a new place or you uh, open a new location. You either have a local tax team there or you have a local partner that's doing those returns for you. We used to see a lot of outsourcing to third parties. So you're getting an accountant or, an, or a consultant to do this for you. Um, it gets harder to do as you expand into new regions. We're also seeing parallel processes historically, right? So you had one tax engine in the US, you had a different one for Europe. Um, you might do your sales tax returns via Avatax, but then you've got a different solution for VAT or partners doing VAT. Um, and the sticky plaster approach. Uh, here's my, my British to American English translation. This is a Band-Aid approach, right? So you see a new problem, you fix it, and then you just wait for the next emergency to, to happen. Uh, moving forward, uh, in order to stay compliant, um, it, it, if you are subject to e-invoicing mandates, you need to be ready for those. 
uh, we're seeing companies think more strategically. So they're looking at global trends um, and coming up with a roadmap and policy, making sure that they're prepared for any changes uh, when they come into play. We're also seeing customers move to a single scalable solution uh, for the technology piece, but also consolidating um, any outsourcing that they're doing. Uh, and hopefully we're seeing an alignment of tax and other business processes. All right, so if all of that sounds really hard and you're wondering if it's even worth doing business internationally, uh, yeah, absolutely. 95% of consumers are based somewhere outside the United States. Um, and when we look at US-based companies, um, most exporters are actually small businesses. So, um, it, you know, if, if they can do it, you can do it. 80% uh, of Avalara customers tell us that they trade in at least two countries. So your, your peers are absolutely trading internationally. The good news is uh, Avalara can help with all of this. So we can help with your British and European and a lot of other uh, taxes across the world. So that's what we wanted to cover today. I wanted to give you a little bit of a preview of our next session. Um, we'll talk about how you can ensure continuous compliance wherever you're trading. Um, we've broken this down into five main steps. First one is understanding where you have obligations, keeping in mind that this changes all the time, getting registered to collect, calculating VAT, GST, sales tax, and duties, implementing e-invoicing solutions where that applies, then reporting taxes. Um, and we've added a sixth step here, uh, reevaluate and repeat. So given the rapid amount of change, this is not a set it and forget it uh, uh, process. You need to be reevaluating, making sure that, uh, that you are always compliant. So we'd like to move you to a cycle of continuous compliance where you're continually looking at where you have obligations, making sure your registrations are current, uh, making sure that Avatax is set up correctly wherever you're trading, implementing e-invoicing where you might need to, and reporting correctly. All right, so um, we've come to the end. We have one last question for you. Uh, what learning from today stood out to you the most? Uh, hopefully you all learned something. We'd love to know what it was. And while you work on that, um, just want to highlight um, some of the Avalara solutions that can help you with international compliance. We can help you with every one of those five steps in the compliance journey. Uh, if you would like to understand what your obligations are internationally, um, we can absolutely help. So just schedule a call with your customer account manager and they can set up a meeting either with me or one of our other VAT specialists. We can help you get registered in 84 countries. If you're selling goods, we can help with HS code uh, classification, and we can help with tax determination. Um, you might not have noticed that Avatax works uh, in 190 countries. We can do sales tax, VAT, GST, customs and duties determination. We also offer e-invoicing in 60 countries and returns and reporting in about 80 countries. So if you need help with any of this, just schedule a call with your customer account manager and uh, your account manager and I will be happy to help. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. I uh, would love to hear what questions you have. All right, perfect. Michelle, thank you so much. That's a lot of content. I'm actually gonna put both of us on the screen here. That's a lot of content that Michelle just went through and it's thick and there's just a lot of layers to it. So I appreciate you breaking it down um, as much as you could. So now we are gonna enter a time of Q and A and if you have a question, use that Q&A box. 
So all questions can go right in that box and then we'll get to them here on the back end and answer them as much as we can. But let's go ahead and jump into some questions. So um, let me start with this one. I think this is a really good one, Michelle. Okay. Can you register in European countries in anticipation of sales? That's a very popular thing to do in the US. Mm -hmm. You're experiencing rapid growth and you pre-register if you, if for a different mm -hmm. word, can you do that in European countries? It depends. Um, most of the time you can, um, but what we are seeing um, when we start to submit registrations to some countries is they want to see um, your, some of your business activity. So they want to see evidence of, uh, of what you're actually doing in that country. So a lot of times they'll want to see an invoice to a customer in that country. Um, mm -hmm. So it, which seems backwards to me, right? You would think that um, they would want you to be compliant before you start doing business in their country. But in some cases, we're seeing them ask um, for evidence that you are, in fact, trading yeah. in that country. Now, some will accept um, some other documentation. So something as simple as purchase of goods that you intend to sell in that country. So you can say, hey, look, I've got all this stock in my warehouse. I want to sell it to German customers or Polish customers. Here's my website that uh, that shows I'm, I'm going to start trading there. Um, and they'll usually accept that. Um, but those are the exceptions. Not every country requires that. In a lot of cases, you can just say, hey, I plan to start selling whatever this particular product is to customers in your country as of you know, February 1st, please accept my application. Perfect. Thank you so much. Kind of in that same vein, are there any trickier countries that you've dealt with, with customers that are more difficult to work with that customers should have a heads up with best practices possibly for certain countries? Well, not necessarily by country, but I would say, um, it, you know, customers that will have um, different expectations uh, might be those that are purchasing luxury goods, right? So we talked a bit about low value consignments, mm -hmm. um, but while you aren't legally obligated to register for VAT, at least in the EU, um, if you're selling things above that $150 threshold, those customers certainly do not to ex expect to spend a bunch of money on your product and then have to pay import fees before they can get their stuff. So and we're actually seeing uh, buyer behavior change, especially in Europe. They didn't really think about imports before, but we're actually seeing customers not only buy a lot more online, um, they're checking to see what the total shipping costs are going to be, right? They've learned in a very painful manner um, that there could be additional customs and duties fees or import VAT, so they're um, a little more savvy about purchasing internationally. We're also seeing uh, customers buying a bunch of stuff online and also returning things, right? So you might be buying something and you buy it in five colors or five different sizes, whatever it is, you send half of them back. So if you don't have a strategy for making sure that you're calculating tax correctly, that's gonna go sideways. The, the particular downside with returns is that you can't recover any of those costs unless you have a VAT registration. So if you are registered for VAT in a country and you have a bunch of returned orders, you can at least report that on your next return and recover some of that VAT that you've already paid. Um, so that, that's one shift which we're seeing. The other is um, business to business transactions. Uh, again, in most countries, if you're 100 percent business to business, you have no obligation to get registered for VAT. Uh, the exceptions are the U.S., uh, Canada, South Africa, Russia. I want to say Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. A few more I always forget, but there's there's really about eight or nine countries where you would have to register for B2B VAT. Um, but because of all of the legal and uh, reporting changes that we're seeing. 
uh, and a lot of scrutiny on business to business transactions. Uh, we're seeing business buyers uh, be a lot more particular about VAT invoices. So mm. um, they want to make sure that you are sending an EU or UK compliant VAT invoice because they want to have really good documentation and they don't want to have a bunch of work. So if you've screwed up the VAT, they don't want to have to correct it. Uh, so we're seeing businesses be very particular about VAT invoices or even require e-invoices. Um, so e-invoices are not always a government mandate. A lot, of, a lot of companies will introduce these just to make their processes more efficient. So we're especially seeing large businesses demand these from, from their vendors uh, something really new I'm seeing is uh, businesses require their vendors to get a VAT registration. Like they don't even want to mess with a reverse charge. They just want you to mm -hmm. be responsible for the VAT. So I, I would say, um, yeah, the, the two challenges would be um, customers that are buying higher value goods and business customers. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Michelle. We have some, a lot of really good questions here. I'm going to keep going. Okay. What if you sell goods and services? Uh, Maybe they're one and the same. Will you have different requirements if you sell goods? Yeah, and services? absolutely. Um, it causes two challenges. The first is a, a registration challenge, um, and the other is a technology challenge, so getting the calculation right. Um, since we're focused on Europe today, um, so the UK is easy, right? There's one registration, one return. So whether you're selling digital services, services, goods, low value consignments, higher value consignments, it's one registration, you've got it all covered on the return. Uh, the EU is probably the trickiest one, right? Because let's say you sell low value consignments um, and software. So I see this in uh, gaming companies, right? So you sell a video game, but then you also sell uh, a t-shirt or a, a, a handset or, um, or whatever else it is you see. The video game knowledge <laughs> coming out. <laughs> toys because I'm a geek myself action figures, right? Let's say you, you, sell, you sell a video game and you sell some stuff. Um, you would need both an IOS registration and an OS registration. So um, IOS would be for low value goods, OS would be for the digital services. Well, that's fine, but what happens if you also sell uh, a game console, right? Or somebody buys 19 t-shirts and it's above that low value threshold. Um, you, well, you have two options here. Um, you can go ahead and get registered for VAT everywhere so that you can report everything on a single return. Um, if not, um, then you've got some tricky determination. So the place of supply rules are different for goods and digital services. So again, if you're importing, it's easy. It's always going to be the customer's location. Uh, but let's say you have a warehouse in Europe where you ship the goods from. So that could change the, the place of supply for goods and digital services. Uh, the other challenge here is handling um, the digital services uh, and goods uh, from a calculation standpoint. So, um, and also low and high value consignments. Uh, it, and it also depends on your, um, on your inco, inco terms. So, you're always going to charge tax on the digital services. You're always going to charge tax on the low value consignments. You've got some options on the higher value consignments. Um, we can make this a lot easier. Uh, there are settings in Avatax that will help you manage this, uh, but it's it's not something that you can do without a tax engine unless you just charge that across the board. Um, the other challenge there, especially for digital services, is um, in B2B transactions. So let's say you're selling goods to a consumer, you apply a reverse charge, probably shouldn't be doing that with the digital services you're, or, or with, with any services. You're supposed to charge tax to the customer at their location. So um, that was a lot of information and a very convoluted explanation, but yes, it, it, it gets a lot more challenging and we can help. <laughs> Thank you. 
Can you tell me a little bit about, like, I keep, I, li I listen to your presentations, I listen to this content, I'm like, what do audits look like in Europe? I think we're more familiar with the concept of an American audit, you know, yeah. you don't follow some of these rules, you get audited, you pay lots of fees and all that kind right. of stuff. What does yeah, that look like in Europe? It, it's the same painful process. Um, so, yeah, it, it's... Um, it's time consuming and it's expensive. They're gonna go through your data with a fine tooth comb. Um, I, I think there's, I think a lot of companies have the perception that they don't have to worry about audits internationally. Uh, we are seeing, again, across the world, we're seeing auditors more focused on international trade. Um, mm. US is probably the worst. We've hired lots of auditors to focus on international trade. Uh, what's probably more common is your customers are getting audited, right? So the auditor is going through their information. They're saying, hey, you bought a bunch of stuff from this person in the U.S. They didn't charge tax correctly. Why didn't you fix it? It's them back to the international seller, right? So the, they find out, hey, you've been trading in this country for 10 years. You've got millions of euro worth of revenue. What the heck, right? And what can happen here is not just the cost of an audit, which is absolutely painful. Um, the penalties are very, very steep. And if you've really screwed it up, they can actually block you from trading in that country. So you can't sell there until you clean up your act, uh, wait a couple years, and then resubmit a registration application. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in general, um, especially if you're trading business to business, um, they're already going to have really good data about you, right? Because uh, your buyers are submitting a lot of detail on their returns. So they're already gonna have some pretty good data about you. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thanks for explaining that. Um, a few more questions that we're gonna try and tackle here. Um, let's see. I'm registered for Moss. Do I need to register for OSS? All the acronyms huh? here today. Okay. All right. So let's talk about MOSS, OSS, and IOS. Um, Wait, maybe we can just so, break that down. <laughs> yeah. So in 2015, the EU eliminated the distance selling threshold for digital services. So what this meant is that if you sold anything that was delivered electronically to a consumer anywhere in the EU, and keep in mind that also included the UK back then, uh, you had to get a registration. They simplified this by introducing the mini one-stop shop. So this was a single registration, one return for all 28 countries where you could report any sales of digital services. Uh, that was expanded with the July 2021 e-commerce reforms. So now in addition to the mini one-stop shop, they've got one-stop shop, which is... Um, the new MOS, so it's the, it's the new registration return for digital services. It can also be used for any other services um, and for movement of goods between EU countries. So um, let's say you shift you ship goods to a warehouse in the Netherlands, you would need a Dutch registration, uh, but then you could use OS for the rest of the EU. Import one-stop shop is for importing goods. So if you sell directly from the U.S. to the EU and you sell low-value consignments, you have an IOS. Um, so those are the three. The, those are the three flavors now. The new, the three new flavors are OS, or excuse me, two new flavors, OS and IOS. Uh, but going back to the MOS uh, question, if you have a MOS registration, you don't need to do anything. That's going to be automatically converted to an OS registration. Unless, of course, you're selling to the UK, right? So now you're going to need two registrations and returns. The OS registration for the EU, and if you're trading in the UK, then you'll need a, a VAT registration there because you can't report your UK registrations on that OS return anymore. So let me reiter reiterate this. Tell me if I got this right. In 2015, it was MOS. Yep. 2021 comes around. It's now OS. Lose yep. the M. Lose the M. It's, it's no longer mini. It's a full OS. It's a grown-up OS. If you are already registered for MOS, it'll be automatically transferred to OS. So it's yep. no need to re-register. Nope. 
And then if you sell to the UK, you need a VAT registration. And then which one's IOS? That's import one-stop shop. So that is importing goods from outside the EU to an EU consumer, but only for low value goods. Got it. Uh, so I, I talked a little bit about, goods. yeah. So, so I, I briefly mentioned OS. Um, one of the common things we see, so yeah, shifting from MOS and digital services back to goods, um, especially as consumers demand more rapid delivery, we're seeing a lot of our customers open VAT warehouses or 3PLs in the European Union so that they can get stuff to customers faster. Um, we see this a lot, especially in the Netherlands, mostly because they have uh, VAT deferment, so you don't have to pay your tax right away if you import there. So in that case, um, if you are importing goods, whether it's to your own warehouse or 3PL um, or to a marketplace warehouse, you have to have a direct registration in any country where you own goods. So let's say you ship to a 3PL in the Netherlands and you've got another one in Poland. You would need a Dutch registration and a Polish registration. But for the rest of the EU, you can have a single OS registration. And that allows you to move goods between the rest of the EU. Okay. That's starting to make a little bit more sense. So I kind of want to wrap this up, and this will be our last question for today. I got to let you get some coffee. <laughs> some yes, water. please. Take a break from all of that talk. But I feel like as a customer, as a human right now, who's really new to these concepts, I have more questions. Okay. Like, I, I feel like I know more, but I also have more questions. I feel like that I is appropriate. I, I think if you think you know everything about VAT after this, um, either <laughs> I didn't do a very good job of saying it was complicated or you weren't paying attention. <laughs> so, yes. All right. You have more questions. How can I help? I have more questions. Do you have any recommendations for related resources, good places to study this a yes. little bit more? Um, places where we can get more information without hiring some expensive yeah. attorney to kind of tell us what to do. What can we do to self-enable our education? Okay. I have a lot of resources. Um, two places I would start. Um, Avalara has a European site called vatlive.com. We have a lifetime supply of white papers and webinars. We also have country guides. So you can go look at every country in the world. We'll tell you what the tax is like. Um, we especially have really good coverage for digital services um, because that's a major pain point for our US customers. Uh, so that's one place to start. And then just in the Avalara blog, uh, there's a lot of information uh, about, um, about VAT. Um, lots and lots of information about e-invoicing right now because that is, that's been, um, a massive headache for European customers. Um, and there is a secret section in the Avalara Help Center that I can tell you guys about. We have a VAT micro site uh, for our VAT reporting and manage VAT reporting customers. And there's a guide in there called Learning VAT. So we'll put the link to that in the resources. That's VAT 101, right? Definitions, how it all works. Um, so I, I can add my favorite resources to, uh, to the list of resources we'll provide everyone. Um, but the other way to do this is um, to have an account review with either myself or one of our VAT specialists in the UK. And you can do that by arranging a call through your customer account manager. Um, and then what we can do is have a look at what your particular concerns are, and we can target some of this information for you because Avalara has a lifetime supply of um, that information and articles. Um, we can help direct you to the to the ones that are most appropriate for you. Perfect, Michelle. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise. I definitely want to check out vatlive.com. Some of those country guides. That sounds really, really helpful. And I. I I'm going to plug out our blog there, like you mentioned. They do a really excellent job, actually, of getting you the information the second, you know, it happens and things are developing. 
have a great team over there. Yeah, I would say as well. Um, so, I mean, we have an army of people that do nothing but look at tax changes, um, especially in Europe. Avalar is really a thought leader. Um, you can actually subscribe to a VatLive newsletter and tell us what you're interested in. And if something changes, you'll be the first to know. So that's a, a great place to make sure that you're up to speed. You don't have to go back and read everything on the Avalar blog every week. Perfect. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. I am just gonna wrap it up with a few reminders. Um, if you qualified for CPE credit, you may now download your certificate in the Earn Certification box or in the post event email. We are offering quite a few CP eligible webinars this quarter. It is the season of giving. You get CPE, you get CPE, you get CPE. So. Go to our webinars page to look for more opportunities um, to earn CPE. I believe we have like four or five this quarter. So go ahead, check those out. And um, if you found today's webinar really, really interesting, join us next week. Michelle is gonna break down those six steps that she mentioned uh, and they present on how to manage international compliance changes. So um, again, in the post event email, you'll get your CPE certificate, you'll get this recording, you'll get all the additional resources. Michelle will make sure to put in those links that you mentioned into that email. But other than that, join us next week for part two, if you will, we'll be diving into those specific six steps. So we've talked about the industry, we've talked about the trends, Let's start getting into the ground level of what exactly you may need to do for your business. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great day and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Michelle. Okay.